Good morning, everybody. My name is Connor Flang, and I'm the Director of Education here at the Southampton History Museum. This morning, we're joined by two really great people, uh, Eric Woodward and Hillary Woodward. Um, today, we're going to be learning about Eric's uh, adventure into doing research on the Southampton whaling captain, Austin Herrick. Hopefully, everybody at this point has gotten a chance to see the blog we put out on Tuesday. If you have not, go to southamptonhistory.org slash blog. And if you search Austin Herrick in the search bar, it'll come up and you can see all the great research that Eric did. Um, and today we're going to learn about how he did it, why he did it, and maybe some other interesting facts along the way. Uh, without any further ado, I'm going to step away and turn it over to Eric. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you, Connor. I'm going to get right into it. Uh, the year 1857. The place, Southampton, New York. <clears throat> My name is Mary Ann Herrick, and I am 11 years old. I live in this old house where North Sea Road forks off North Main Street. My father, Austin, has invited some friends over. My older brother, Samuel, and I can join them around the parlor fireplace. He describes how, as a young man, he proposed to marry my mother before he headed out to sea. She said no, and soon after that, he went off whaling again this time all the way to a place called Brazil. A storm wrecked their vessel on a barren shore. All the crew survived, but they had a perilous month long trek to Rio de Janeiro. A ship captain there could only take six of the crew back to New England. They drew straws to see who could go. Father was not picked, but somehow he stole away on the boat. He returned to Sag Harbor and walked home. When he appeared on the road in Southampton, a woman standing at her gate cried out, Lord have mercy, we thought you drowned in the bottom of the ocean. As everyone knows, mother and father got married pretty soon after that. So who is Austin Herrick and what is his story? We have just heard a dramatization of Mary Ann Herrick. Dramatization meaning that what we just heard maybe happened, maybe didn't. She's 10 years old when she tells the story of her father, Austin, being shipwrecked in Brazil. Curiosity about this story and others led me to become the family detective. My goal, getting the facts. Today, we will unfold the process and the detective work I undertook to get to know Austin Herrick. I moved to Southampton right out of architecture school. I soon met Hillary Herrick. We married and in, in 1890, 1892, <laughs> 1982, that's one date I'm supposed to know. And since Herrick is such an important name in Southampton, I'm told I should become Eric Herrick. Now, I can't hear you all laughing, but that was, that was my initial joke. Hillary happily becomes a Woodward though. So here's the Herrick's house on North Main Street in Southampton. In these early years, when I was there dining with the family at the house, conversations often went like this. Was that when Jack's brother-in-law got married? Did they have five children or four? Remember when Peter moved to California? Was that before George shot dear old Bess with the blunderbuss? It was all I could do just to figure out who I was sitting around the table with, much less who was being discussed. So I decided to study the family genealogy. This wasn't actually too hard because uh, the, much of the family tree was already recorded. I produced the document you see here. And of course, I've been updating it ever since. As you can see, it's a very big family tree. Zoom in and see oodles of information. Today, much of the research would be done on the internet, of course. But not then. Um, and on the internet, you definitely still have to be careful about inaccuracy. Um, Ancestry.com is well known, but there's a site on Long Island, which I find even more useful, called Long Island Surnames.com. So here I've zoomed in and highlighted uh, 
there's Hillary. The, 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 the people are all put in by generation. So you follow the line to Hillary's mother and father, Austin, his parents, John Austin Herrick, Nancy Ann Hunting, their, uh, John Austin's parents, Henry Foster Herrick, Mary Ann Herrick, and it's a little crowded up here, but we get to Austin Herrick. Important Southampton whaling captain, born 1796. He lived in the family home on North Main Street, died in 1862. And at this point, making the family tree, that's about all I knew. So in 1994, I started a scrapbook style history of the Herrick House. It took two or three years. I searched, I found every bit of information about the house I could. The information from before its construction when the street was laid out in the 1600s, right up to the present. Uh, here, this page you're seeing now is the page from 1779 showing that the house was occupied by the British and used as their commissary. Next, you're looking at here the page from 1835. Austin Herrick buys the property and marries Mary Wells Jagger. So at this point, I realized there was very little information about Austin in the family books and the family records but I included on this page two important documents that we're gonna, both, both of these documents we're gonna to refer to during the whole detective search here. First uh, is a letter that Austin's daughter, Mary Ann, who Hillary was playing the part of Mary Ann earlier and we'll hear from her again. Um, she wrote to her son in 1914. She goes into great detail about all of the contents of the house. She also includes some information on the family. Interestingly though, she never once refers to Austin as captain. Her letter starts with advice many historians might give. Someday you will wish you knew more about this old house and its contents and there will be no one to tell you. I could tell you more if I had mindful to ask my forebears while they were still here, but it is not in the nature of youth to care much about things of the past. The second important document included is in my early scrapbook, a version of the Brazil shipwreck story that Hillary just dramatized. This version of the story was published in the 1929 Southampton Press. It's a great story. Now, of course, as Connor mentioned, all of these documents that I'm presenting here are, are in full on the blog, available for, for those who want to read and read and read. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. So anyway, this is a great story, but you can't trust everything you read in the paper. I certainly found that. Um, so I've, I've finished up that house history. In other words, the house history is separate from genealogy. And it's time to find out more about Austin. Moving on to 1996, I go to the John Germain Library in Sag Harbor. Of course, Sag Harbor, they would know all about Captain Austin Herrick, but unfortunately they inform me there is no record of Captain Herrick sailing from Sag Harbor, nor even a record showing crew member named Austin Herrick. Uh-oh, they suggest I write to historian George Finkenor to try to get more info on the authenticity of this Brazil shipwreck story. His reply, which I've, I've included on the screen here, my letter and his letter, it's not all that helpful. My next attempt is at the Southampton Colonial Society. Uh, of course, this is now known as the Southampton History Museum and they're bringing you this presentation. 
seem to be getting lots of emails, oh boy. Um, so they have three letters they pull out of, out of their files, three letters concerning Austin. Uh, we see here the original letter and Hillary's able transcription. Not an easy job transcribing. First letter here is crew member James H. Foster. He's writing to his parents from the ship Atlas. Remember the name Atlas. There's going to be a quiz on this at the end. You've got to remember all these names and dates. Uh, 1832 was when this letter was written. The ship is embarked from Norwich, Connecticut. James reports they have already run aground before they get to New London. <laughs> On James's next page, we see our first, what we call primary source document, proving Austin was in fact a captain. Not only that, James says Captain Herrick has the patience of Job. Captains did not always have a uh, good reputation. They were often tyrants. So it's nice to see that Austin got good, good grades from one of his crew members. In the next letter, it's written by, by James to his parents from the South Atlantic. He reports he is well and describes a number of things about the shipboard life. Here he is uh, writing, uh, this, is, this isn't about Herrick, but it's interesting, so I'm gonna read it. We board the boats as usual and went off, chased some time. Finally, Mr. Rayner struck the whale. The whale run about 20 rods, then brought two, one rolled fin out. I guess he rolled on his side and the fin up in the air. Immediately hold up to the, oh, they on the boat immediately hold up to the whale, but the whale went down and had an appearance of sounding too. He took about 15 fathoms of line then the whale turned underwater and came up very quickly and breached onto the boat and killed poor George Pelletro. We do expect instantly for the boat upset and he went down, never to arise anymore. So third letter, here we have a letter from Captain Austin Herrick to James Foster, Mr. James Foster. His son has died at sea. It is my most painful duty to apprise you. Your son James is no more. He died, I think, of consumption. So, my search goes back on, onto the back burner for quite a while. Hillary's father, Sam Herrick, passes away in 1898. 19 I mean, here again, 1998. Hillary's mother, Constant Herrick, passes away in 2008. Hillary and her sister Deborah go through the jointly inherited contents of the house in preparation for Deborah and Noel to take ownership. A few boxes of papers and books and photos come out of our basement. I'm not sure how uh, many, I mean, I'm sure many of you have such boxes. They're important things, but they're not necessarily put in any good order with good labels. Certainly worth looking at though. Someday I will organize all this is the common refrain. In 2017, the History Museum plans an exhibit about Southampton whaling, including brief pro profiles of several whaling captains who lived in the village. We hope Austin will be included in the exhibit, Hillary and I, the rest of the family, but all we have is the three letters from the 1832 voyage and the still unsubstantiated story of the Brazil shipwreck. It's time I get into some more serious investigating. Hillary and I pull out the boxes from the basement. We still don't find much about Austin, but there is an unidentified whaling logbook we had never seen. 276 pages, daily entries for five different whaling voyages. Each one is identified by date, location, and captain. The first voyage is from Sag Harbor to Pantagonia, 
in the good ship Fair Helen, 1824. George Howell Master. The last journal is a trip from South Atlantic in the ship Atlas, here we are, the name Atlas again, out of Lynn, Massachusetts, H. Gardner Master. This was in 1830 to 31. Here is a typical day's entry. Light winds, we saw a number of whales and one sail. Is that another boat? I'm not sure. Kill a whale and got him alongside. All hands employed in cutting, boiling, and whaling. Now, significant to handwriting through this document is all the same. It's clear whoever wrote it, and we don't know whoever wrote it, was on all five voyages. So we go through page by page, investigating. Finally, on the entry of October in 1825, just once in this whole journal, I find the name Austin Herrick. Let's see it up here, Austin Herrick. And it is, it's not like somebody else came and signed his name. It's the same handwriting as the rest of the journal. So this is exciting. Uh, we pull out the 1833 letter Austin wrote as captain of the Atlas. It is even more exciting. The signatures clearly match. So this is the letter he wrote in the 1832 and his signature down there. You don't have to be too much of a, of a handwriting expert to see, definitely the same guy. So that proves it's, it's his logbook. Among other things, we can now cross-reference Austin's voyages with official records. For example, one of the best reference books is the History of American Whale Fisheries Report of the Commissioner of the Fish and Fisheries it lists page after page of whaling voyages. For example, here is the 1828 voyage of the ship Thames or Thames. Somebody maybe could correct me on that. In England, it's the Thames, but maybe in Connecticut, it's the Thames. I don't know. Um, so even though this ship sailed from Sag Harbor, Austin is not mentioned in the official records. We now know he was on the boat, but no mention of Austin. He wasn't captain. Now, I have read that many of Sag Harbor's whaling crew lists were lost in a fire in the 1800s. So that's why Austin never showed up in the Sag Harbor records. Regarding records, I should also mention here that the New Bedford Whaling Museum has put together a fabulous website database. Of course, this research, research <laughs> resource didn't exist when I was doing the beginning of all this research. So this is their home page, and this is a typical search page. You can search by master, you can search by vessel, you can search all, all sorts of ways. In fact, if you're, you know, for the ultimate geek down here in the corner, they have sources. Each one of these numbers refers to the original documentation they got their information from. They must have had an army of people looking up this stuff. Because it's, it's just, it goes on and on. It's wonderful. So here's another of their pages. We saw in Austin's journals, he sailed out of, he sailed on the Atlas out of, out of Lynn in 1831. So I've, I've marked here with the arrow. Uh, these are all the version, all the sailings of Atlas and it lists where he came from it. And they even have the vessel with a boat number. They give each boat a number. AS0926. Make note of that, everybody. This is important. There we go. Couldn't get backwards. I do a search for Austin Herrick. There is only one reference on their site, but it's right on target. It lists Austin's voyage of the ship Atlas out of Norwich 
1832. That's where those letters were written from. Vessel AS0930, not the same atlas. It includes a crew list. Austin is five foot 10 inches tall. 17 of the racially diverse crew of 25 were from Southampton, the others being from Connecticut. James Foster is listed on the crew list, but no mention of his passing. History of the American whale fisheries, for some reason, makes no mention of the 1832 Atlas voyage from Norwich, nor Austin Herrick, which he should, they should at this point, since he's, we know he's the captain. And I can't explain why, because they're a pretty thorough source. Anyway, this does explain why previous searches locally here came up with no information on Austin Herrick as the whale boat captain. There's also an interesting detail here, explains these Atlas ship numbers. The Atlas out of Lynn continued sailing on that list we saw 1832, 1833 out of Lynn with a new captain. Simultaneously, the Atlas was sailing out of Norwich. So clearly there were two ships named Atlas and Atlas sailed on one, I mean, <laughs> Two ships named Atlas and Austin sailed on one out of Lynn in 1830 and the other out of Norwich in 1832. Typical sort of things that confuses a historian. One Austin, but two Atlases. So we've now confirmed Atlas made it to the rank of captain for the 1832 voyage. And we know he quit whaling and he married and settled down in Southampton in 1835. But what about the whole shipwreck in Brazil story? Thorn in my side. His record of back-to-back -back voyages doesn't seem Austin had much time to be shipwrecked in the middle of all that. It's time to keep going on the investigation. Austin's daughter Mary's long letter to her son in 1914 makes no mention of the shipwreck. You might think it was important. But she does say this. When my father came home from sea for good, he remembered that on a short stay home on a previous voyage, he had seen a beautiful girl whom he vowed to make his wife someday. Now, looking through these boxes in the basement, it turns out that in 1924, Mary had been in touch with the local historian, Harry Slight. We have the letters from him to her, but unfortunately we don't have her side of the correspondence. To summarize his six pages, he says, without hard information, that the shipwreck was the Warren in 1816. 1816, does that make sense? Mary Jagger was only eight years old that year. People might've gotten married young, but I don't think he was proposing when she was eight years old. <laughs> Slight does add one new detail. Mary, we haven't seen this anywhere else. Mary says Austin's first whaling voyage was in 1816 when he was 20 years old. So a short time later, historian Slight pens the shipwreck story in a Riverhead newspaper saying that the shipwreck of the Warren is a quote tradition. That's a way of saying he doesn't have the the hard facts in Southampton. He attributes the date to 1816, but he does not include the name Austin Herrick. Otherwise, this version of the story, and you see a copy of it here in the, in the Riverhead paper, this version of the story was copied exactly by Lisbeth White in the 1929 Southampton Press article. We, we read that earlier uh, as part of the house history. And that's, of course, the story Hillary dramatized at the beginning. Um, she leaves out the date, though, of the shipwreck, but adds the name Austin Herrick. So I have this feeling both authors are leaving out some significant parts of the story because they realize, well, it doesn't actually add up. Now, Slight refers to the 1902 book, Historic Long Island by Rufus Wilson. 
Slight, actually, it turns out, his version that he wrote was an exact copy of Wilson's, except when Wilson first wrote the story, he makes no mention of the name of the ship, the name of the young man, the ship's captain, nor the year. But he does seem accurate about the description of the house that Austin ends up returning to and its location. But things still don't seem right. I'm looking for a primary force, a primary source to verify everything. Internet search, to, search tools and the amount of indexed information these days is remarkable, but I still came up with nothing. Shipwreck or no shipwreck. I have to shift my search to just filling in the details of the rest of Austin's life. Why did Austin Herrick retire from whaling after his 1832, 1832 voyage? At age 38, he was young enough to continue working. The whaling industry was at its peak. He had achieved the rank of captain and he had returned with a successful voyage. His daughter writes, My father bought this place in 1835. He was married the same year. He had left the sea because he would not whale on Sundays. So here we have a clipping from the 1924 Brooklyn Times Union. And it gives us some additional details. It describes the shipping board insisted that he whale seven days a week. So even then it wasn't a free spirited world of whaling. There was the shipping board. According to the article, Austin's crew complained at the end of his voyage that Austin wouldn't let them catch whales on Sunday. Mary Ann Herrick quotes her father. I owe allegiance to a higher than human law and cannot break my religious pledge. So the newspaper article concludes, he lost his ship. Unfortunately, we don't have any detailed account of this story in the Herrick family papers. I'm, I'm sure there might be some more to it. But let me add my own conjecture. Whaling was a really tough occupation. He had been at it continuously for 18 years. He might have just been ready for a more comfortable life settling in Southampton. Austin and Mary Jagger settle into the house on North Main Street. Six years pass. Wonderful, these old derogatite portraits. They're practically right there. Six years pass, they have their first son, Samuel Edward Herrick. In 1846, so that's 11 years after he came out, came back from sea, they have daughter Mary Ann Herrick. Here you see pictures of her. Of course, the voice, the young voice that we started with and the voice of her later writings. So once again, I have to dive in a little deeper. Uh, I'm going to look into another misconception, and that is uh, the store, Herrick Hardware. In 1835, Austin decided to keep store in the store that was connected to the little house by a passageway. Here's the oldest known picture photograph of the house possibly taken in the 1860s. It's viewed from the Southeast looking uh, across North Main Street. The attached store is still visible. It's strategically placed uh, facing out toward the triangle formed by the intersection of North Sea Road. Some of you locally might know, this is where there is now a cannon out in front of the house. 
The Herrick family papers include almost nothing about the store. It's typical small town stores in the 1800s sold a variety of merchandise. The 1837 receipt here shows A. Herrick buying supplies for the store from a New York City confection. Now, here we are, Main Street, the ever popular Herrick hardware store. And it's often assumed that Austin's 1835 store became Herrick Hardware. But did Austin found Herrick Hardware? And here's a map by J. Chase, oops, J. Chase Jr., 1858. And it confirms, 1858 map confirms up here at the top, a. Herrick's store at the intersection. Austin passed away in 1862. There's no record concerning the status of his store. Perhaps Austin's wife or his daughter ran the store for a few years, but there's no evidence in family papers. Again, we hear from Mary, here referring to the property. Father died. We had a hard struggle mother and I, to keep it. But some way, God helped us, and I hope to pass it on to you as a sacred gift. So we have to switch for a minute. We have a different Herrick family. Here is Henry Foster Herrick, born in 1847. He obviously went to the same daguerreotype photographer in Sag Harbor. So we're back at the family tree. Takes a little explaining here. As you can see, Henry Foster Herrick marries Mary Ann Herrick. His fathers, John Pierpoint Herrick and ancestors go up, up the tree. Um, so they're fourth cousins. Oh, there's an interesting little bit of trivia here also. Henry Foster Herrick's mother's brother was James Foster who passed away on Austin's 1832 voyage. So Henry started working for Charles Parsons in 1866. He was 19 years old. This was four years after Austin had passed away. Parsons was postmaster and ran a general store in the center of Main Street. So we look back at the 1858 map and of course we see store and post office C. Carson, uh, Parsons. In 1869, Henry buys the store from Mr. Parsons. The picture here is of that store. The name Herrick has gone up on the door. The well-dressed man we could maybe assume is Henry Herrick. The photograph is dated between 1869 and 1876, because at that point they built an entirely new building. So historians love maps. Here is another map, 1873. There's no mention of the store up at the house. It's mentioned Mrs. Herrick's house. Down on Main Street though now, it is H.F. Herrick's store and post office. So Mary Ann Herrick gets married to Henry Foster Herrick, 1881. In other words, things have been going for a while. Yeah. Uh, she is 35 years old. She has just inherited the North Main Street family home. She's been living there along, all along with her mother. Um, the bride and groom start their life together in the, in the family home. Henry creates a successful business. 
Here's the, the uh, 1895 picture of the house. And by comparing some photographs, it isn't labeled on the photograph, but by comparing the young kids style, the dog who even shows up in another picture and this gentleman's hairstyle, pretty sure, oh, I'm pointing with my finger, pretty sure that this is Henry and this is his son, John Austin Herrick, who's actually Hillary's grandfather. So we can wrap up the detective work on this part. Seems very unlikely there was any connection between Herrick Hardware on Main Street and Austin's store connected to his house. First, Henry was only 15 when Austin passed away. Second, when Henry reached the working age of 19, he went right to work for Parsons. Third, Henry's son, John Austin Herrick, we just saw in the picture, he took over the business and he made no mention of Austin's store in his short handwritten Herrick Hardware history. So this brings us up to about a year ago, COVID time. I had uncovered a lot more details about Austin's life than I ever thought I would find. But I'm particularly disappointed. The Brazil shipwreck story, most exciting event in Austin's life, it still is unsubstantiated. And I pretty much decided I would never track it down. I decided to contact the Norwich Historical Society, just see if they had stuff about Austin's 1832 voyage. They referred me to the Norwich Otis Library, and I got a reply from their genealogist, Kathleen Whelan. She confirmed the Atlas was one of the two whale ships sailing from Norwich in 1832, but she didn't have much more details at all. By the way, she asks, have you seen these two clippings from 1819 that talk about the rescue of a whaling crew from a Brazil shipwreck, including Austin Herrick? At long last, it's true. The brig Harriet was shipwrecked off Brazil. Austin Herrick was brought back to New England. No more conjecture. Here are primary sources with corroborating details. Yay. <laughs> it turns out the history of American whale fisheries is so comprehensive that it does include this sailing. Here we show 1818 Harriet, but it doesn't say, you know, mostly it says which port all these ships sail from. Here it's blank, it doesn't say the port. So this explains why a search for a shipwrecked vessel from Sag Harbor always came up empty. The New Bedford Whaling Database has this same information, but nothing, nothing additional. Over here, though, it even says, lost on the coast of Brazil. So I guess if I had read all 400 pages of this document, I might have come across that, I don't know, but I didn't. So my final conclusion. Here we are, conclusions on the shipwreck story. The story is true with the following clarifications. It was the brig Harriet rather than the ship Warren. They sailed in 1818. And so it was likely Austin's second voyage at sea. Now, even though the official records don't show the port of departure, the news report says they sailed from Sag Harbor. Now it is still unverified that Austin stowed away to secure his passage. It would be fun to find more if we ever can. Austin's proposal to marry Jagger also must have taken place much later than the shipwreck, possibly between the end of his 1830 voyage and the start of his 1832 voyage. Now, maybe the Jagger family will find something up in their attic which tells her story, her side of the story. You know, the telling of history never ends. It's always mortifying. So, Austin died in 1862, age 66. 
Here he rests in peace across the street from the family home. His wife, Mary Jagger Herrick, died 19 years later when she was 73 years old. His daughter, Mary Ann Herrick, she was only 16 when he died. She lived for another 65 years. This is why I think maybe some of the stories changed a little bit in that 65 year time. But anyway, we have this picture about 1895. It's Austin's daughter, Mary Ann. And uh, grandson of um, Austin, John Austin Herrick in front of the family homestead and the same dog and, and pretty much the same clothes we saw in that other picture. So, so we don't have any final words from Austin, but we do have this from daughter Mary Ann. This pilgrim has had all the varieties of joy and sorrow that come to a woman's life. Life has been wonderful, a wonderful mosaic, mother love, baby kisses, happy new years, before the darkness of desolation came, love of a new daughter, friends burdens, and over all and through it all, all of its days and nights, through all of its days and nights, God and love, Always, always, always. So that's our presentation. Thank you. That was great, guys. It's it's a uh, it's always awkward with these uh, virtual lectures that no one claps at the end or anything. But, <laughs> but I imagine all the, uh, the all the people watching at home right now are probably all clapping or, or no, saying how great wait, this was. Connor, they have to wake up before they can clap. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, but to all of you now just waking up, if you do have any questions, uh, please do feel free to submit them in the Q&A function or in the chat bar on the side, and I will begin asking uh, all your questions to Eric and Hillary now. Um, we do have a few in the chat and a few people saying some stuff, so let me go through here. Um, so first one is someone's asking, where would I find the history of American whale fisheries reports of fish and fisheries? That book actually is in its entirety online. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure it's through uh, uh, Google Books, but I think it is. Yeah, I've definitely read through sections of it that I found online before. Um, so it's, it's out there to be able to find. I don't have an exact link or anything per se, but I just Googled it just now and I found something that looks to be somewhat of a free transcribed version of it. So if you do Google the title, it comes up with a bunch of links that you can find. Um, and I believe we have it here in the collection at the Southampton History Museum. So if you want to take a look at it, you could always come by make an appointment and photocopy or take pictures of any pages that are of interest. So let's see, we have someone uh, from a Marguerite Herrick. Uh, love this Uncle Eric and Aunt Hillary. Uh, look forward to viewing uh, the rest of the presentation later. Thank you for all your hard work. Um, Thank you, Marguerite. <laughs> let's see. Uh, da, da, da. And someone's asking if you've shared uh, your information with any online resources or if you've placed them all with us here at the museum. So have you uh, shared it around anywhere else? Not yet, but I'm looking forward to, you know, there were, there were a few people that helped along the way that um, I'm afraid though, they're going to say, Hey, wait a minute, you got this wrong. You got that <laughs> wrong, but no, I do want to share it. Yeah. But, um, if anyone is interested, you can view it all now on our website. Like I said, at the top of this, if you go to our blog and you search Austin Herrick, it also should be, I think probably the most recent post on there right at the top, but you can see it all laid out on there. Um, you can click all the pictures. So you can see them a little bigger if they're smaller. Um, and yeah, it's all like Eric said, it's a lot. There's a lot of info on there. So it's it's a it's a good read that'll take you a bit to get through, but it's a lot of great information. Um, let's see. In your research, did you come across any song or poem texts or uh, mention of any favorite songs or poems that were done by uh, Austin or friends of Austin's? No, not a bit. That's, that's just, I'm not thinking of. 
I, I don't think so, but I, as a religious man, I'm sure there were lots of hymns that <laughs> were <laughs> sung or read. Let's see. A lot of people saying great job and thank you and things like that. Uh, and yeah, a lot of people saying thanks. Pretty much everybody in the chat saying that this was a great talk and, a, and thank you for it. Um, well, let's see here. We have another question from Crystal Woodward. Um, is there any chance there might be uh, traces in Brazil? Um, how could one find this? Uh, you'd have to have someone go looking or it could be done via the internet though that might be in Portuguese. Volunteers? Um, <laughs> who speak Portuguese? I, I have thought that would be the next frontier because there probably is a record of the ship. Uh, um, the, the interesting thing is that they recovered 900 barrels of oil off the shipwreck. Um, so that, uh, you know, there's gotta be a record that, that this happened, I would think down there. So. Yeah. Yeah, we have to find some, again, like you said, maybe some of the uh, Jaggers will find in their attic, but maybe some Brazilian person will find it in their attic, no. uh, this, <laughs> and then transcribe it, and then we can eventually uh, check that out. No. Um, like you said, that is sort of the problem with history research. It is never ending. Uh, there's always something to find. It's usually just a matter of time. Let's see. We have more people coming in saying that this was great. Um, and let's see, uh, from Lucy Woodward, uh, what was your favorite part of the research process? Definitely finding that reference that the, that the shipwreck happened and that Austin was there by name. I never expected, you know, I'd spent so long looking. You know. It was exciting, really exciting moment. <laughs> see uh oh oh crystal uh woodward also just asked again um more specifically trying to find the routes that the boats took so that way you might be able to get a sense of where the wreck happened did you see any sort of reference into where that might have occurred in the log book or anything well um there's an answer to that that's very specific um every day they took long longitude and latitude measurements and wrote them down and these days you can type those numbers into Google Maps, just as long as you've used the right syntax of degrees and minutes, and it pops up on the map exactly where they were. So it's pretty easy now to chart a course. It seems, and I did that a little bit, and it seems like at least these voyages, they pretty much took a beeline to um, an area Kristen de Kuna, I'm saying that wrong probably, but it was a, it was one of the most remote islands in, in the Atlantic Ocean, but mm. they seemed to circle around down there. Uh, you know, they'd get there and they'd spend months uh, in that vicinity and then, and then beeline it back. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. Did, did you have a uh... Was there a longitude latitude points for the ship that may have crashed in, in Brazil or do you not have those? No, because uh, that was prior to Austin's uh, journaling. It gotcha. was only his second, we think it was his second voyage. So he was probably uh, you know, um, chasing the rats or whatever the, the, the job that's the least desirable. Like he wasn't doing a journal yet, so. Very true. You know, um, there is, there is a log book of his um, second to last voyage at the Library of Congress. And I wrote to them, but I haven't heard back. I think that's another field trip because I'm not sure how much they let people see things or how much research they do for people. I think you sort of have to go there. And Very true. It. Yeah, unless it's digitized, it might be another field trip you have to make. But. Uh, I, I determined it's not part of their digital collection. Uh, let's see. So we have a uh, from uh, from Pen uh, from Penny Wright asking uh, or saying thank you, Eric. That this was great, and said now, are you willing to be set loose on our families? <laughs> <laughs> you found a new side career here. You could uh, be loaned out to different families around the village to uh, do some research. <laughs> yeah. um, Good. Let's. 
see. So um, we had a lot more people coming in through the chat asking, uh, or mostly all saying that, thank you, this was great. Um, this is wonderful from Julie Green, the town historian, saying that this was that this was a great talk. Um, and yeah, I think I think that looks like about it. If anybody else has any questions, uh, feel free to send them in. If you don't get them in before we end right now, uh, send me an email. You can always pass that along to Eric. And yeah, I just want to say to both Eric and Hillary, thanks for for doing this today. Uh, it was been a lot of fun talking with Eric over the last few months when he first came by with this information. Uh, which I didn't even know you're doing this research. I think I'd heard maybe on occasion that you were doing something, but then when I saw it all, I was, I was really impressed by the amount of work that was done and now having it available to the public is a really great resource. So I want to thank you for sharing that with us and doing today's talk. Well, Connor, I've got to thank you and the museum because uh, uh, Connor took my chapter after chapter of material and put it into a format that works online for the blog. So. Uh, it kind of gets a lot of credit for that. And also I have to say that when you did the exhibit of the uh, whaling captains and we were at the point of partial information about the shipwreck story, you managed to write the history vaguely enough that it was, it, it, it appeared to uh, give the gist of what was going on without stumbling too much over the details. So good job in that score. Yeah, I, I think I was mostly an editor or looking for typos on that exhibit. That was mostly like credit goes to Mary Cummings and oh. uh, our former curator, uh, Emma uh, Ballou. But, um, but yeah, no, that was a great exhibit. And yeah, that was that was the most I knew about Eric or, or uh, Austin Herrick then was sort of the vague history. So it was nice reading this and getting a more concise, accurate representation. So um, yeah, again, I want to thank you again for doing this talk and Hillary. I just want to thank you, Connor, and the staff at the museum. I am so impressed with how you all work together and create these wonderful programs. And it's just amazing if, if people haven't, um, you know, been in touch physically with the museum in a while. It's, uh, I think you're open, right? Yeah, yeah, we are open Wednesdays and Saturdays. You can give us a call and you can set up a tour. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, incredible what's going on down there. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, so yeah, if anyone's interested, we are open to the public. Outdoors are always open, but if you want to come in, just give us a call and we can set up an appointment and you can come by and see our exhibits that are going on. But uh, but again, yeah, I want to thank everybody for this talk and we'll see you, we'll see you around. Okay, thank you. Great.